Okay, so yeah, I'm, I'm here today to talk about uh, Python and H2O. Um, so I'm going to talk about myself for like five seconds, and then about H2O for about 20 seconds, and then I'm going to jump into a Python demo. So um, who am I? Um, I've been writing code for uh, you know like more than 40 years. Um, I built my first compiler when I was 15, so it's not the usual usual story for 15-year-old kids. Um, been doing distributed computing for 30 years, 20 years doing OS device drivers. Um, I'm sort of the 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 guy who did the core guts of the hotspot JIT that made um, you know Java go fast and also showed the world that basically you could JIT code and now everyone does it. Um, and I've got all kinds of hundreds of talks and dozens of patents and all kind of fun stuff. So I, I'm, I'm a sort of a really hardcore, serious, slow-level deep hacker. I watched the computer stack grow up from you know nothing to what it is today, and I understand it at all kinds of layers. Um, so that's where I'm at, and that's where I'm coming from. Um, H2O is this uh, project I've been working on for the last three years, uh, and it's an open source, you can get it off GitHub, uh, platform for doing machine learning on big data. So distributed, in memory, um, and, and very fast, but also the best quality algorithms we can get. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how we get there, but the, the core notion here is you're gonna be able to run um, generalized linear modeling, gradient boosted method, random forest, deep learning, PCA teams, there's lots of them, and more, and we keep adding more. Um, and then we have a lot of connectors. Um, so while it's written in Java, so obviously you can connect it with from Java, we have a very strong R uh, connector that we've had working well for the last um, year and a half, maybe. Um, we basically cloned that technology to do a Python uh, wrapper, and I'll show you how that works. Um, that's my demo coming up here in about five minutes. And Spark and Scala, and there's a click-through browser GUI so you can be one of the, uh, what the last guy called a suit, and click, 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 and get a, a good model, good predictions out. And, um, and it clustered computing, so that means big data. So however much data will fit in however big, much memory you have in a cluster. Um, we can spin up a terabyte cluster in seconds uh, on EC2, it's not very expensive, uh, and load a terabyte of data into it and begin modeling immediately. Okay, so um, a quick company slide. Uh, as usual with startups, the slide's already old. There are several faces missing. Uh, I think the, the, the takeaway here at the bottom is the Scientific Advisory Council, um, Stephen Boyd, Rob Chipsrani, and Trevor Hasty, or sort of like the, the modern uh, three musketeers of the mathematical and stats community. These guys are writing, inventing the newest of the new, the best of the machine learning algorithms out there. Um, and, and they come and visit us, and we go and visit them on a regular basis. So our algorithms really are, uh, you know, the, the newest of the new and the best of the best. It's, it's good stuff. Um, so uh, uh, this is my one, you know, community-related slide here. So we're building a practical machine learning tool. Um, and what does practical mean? It means uh, different things to different people. So on the left here, you know, fast interactive means in memory. So we're memory speed, we're not disk speed. So, so order of magnitude is uh, seconds to, to low minutes to build models on uh, you know, hundreds of gigabytes to a terabyte, right? So big data, the reason for the big data is you don't have to go through the pain of so much sampling. Um, you can use everything you got if your cluster is big enough, and we're actually very uh, parsimonious on memory. Um, so really, if you have a CSV on disk that's a terabyte, it'll load into a terabyte in RAM uh, just like that. Um, and that, of course, drives at the requirement that you have to be distributed. So this is distributed computing now. So it's clustered stuff. Um, it's open source. You can see and know how it works. See what the algorithm's doing, see why it's there. Uh, if there's a flaw or some new feature you want to add, you can go look at the code and see what's going on. Um, we have a, a, a very nice API for coding distributed computing at scale. So it's based on a MapReduce style paradigm, and I'll go as far as you want into how that works when we get there. Um, I'm going to demo stuff first, but it has nothing to do with Hadoop MapReduce. So I say MapReduce, don't think Hadoop. Think more like, kind of like the Python version, if you will. It's a very theoretically clean map and reduce, and it leads to a very simple coding style so that you can focus on writing the math and the, the data munging and the code that you want to do and not focus on the issues of how to write a cluster, how to define, uh, you know, open MPI, message passing, whatever. None of that shit happens. You just write straightforward, simple, inline code in Java at this point. And it will run it distributed and scale out. So we auto-parallelize in that sense. Um, 
is very portable, being Java, and uh, on the inside for the implementation, and on the outside layer, there's a REST JSON API, and anything that can do REST and JSON can talk to the system, and that's how we're gonna drive it from Python. Right? And then because it's a cluster, you have to have a cluster somewhere. I'm gonna run a cluster of one on my laptop, you can run it in your private data center, you can run it in EC2 or in any cloud computing. Um, you know, four machines in this room, if multicast is enabled, could cluster up just in seconds. So it's really fast to launch a cluster, and it's just one jar file, java.jar, run a cluster, you're good. Make sure that here as we go. Okay, so a little tiny bit of high-level architecture, uh, and then we're gonna dive into demo here. So um, there's a core thing, and oh, the colors are all messed up. The core thing, and kind of the lower middle, is um, the write block is distributed in memory key value store. We have a very high speed, high quality key value store. Um, we don't market and sell it because that market's flooded, um, but it makes very easy coding. Um, we call them compressed data. The compression strategies typically get two to four X better than gzip on disk. So when I talk about being, we're, we're low memory consumers, we are, we're typically better than your gzip file by a fair amount better. And that in turn means that we can stream data through the memory buses and up into the CPU registers at two to four X better than you can stream the uncompressed data. So it's actually faster to have it compressed. And we will decompress it only in the machine registers and throw the compression away. Um, it's all run off of Java Heap, so we run with GC, but we use a very, um, the default collector with max heap settings will give you excellent performance because of the way we structure the data. From that core, we build these algorithms. So I'm listing here a handful. We have quite a few more and sort of generic data munging. We're basically putting together a large vector calculator, a distributed vector calculator scale, and we write algorithms using that. Over that layer, we have a bunch of interfaces, including the REST and JSON. On one side, leading out to uh, where it says R, and the execution is Python as well. Um, or Spark and Scala, where Scala is in process in the JVM, so it doesn't need to go through the REST layer, but it has the same interface ultimately. And then we can emit a model out on the right-hand side, it's basically pretty print a model as Java code, but we could pretty print it in any language you want, it's not hard to write a pretty printer. And then that model is standalone, can be taken into some production setting where it doesn't have to have H2O anywhere in sight. Uh, it can be written in Python or wherever your C, C++, Fortran, wherever you want to take that model, it's standalone by itself, and they can make predictions um, generally in you know eh, high nanos, low microseconds, depending on the complexity of your model. Okay, I, oh, this is a demo here. Okay, so demo. Um, I'm gonna uh, as a demo, I'm gonna run IPython notebook. I'm gonna grab uh, uh, 10 million rows of data of city bike from city bike of New York City. So this is. Uh, bicycles that are all over the city in bike stations, and you put a credit card, you grab a bike out of a locked rack, and you have a bike until you return it to some rack, and then you're, you're charged for the duration you held the bike. So I have 10 million trips, um, and I'm gonna, going to run a little pseudo data science game here where I'm gonna try and figure out the number of bike trips that leave any given station any given day, because uh, at the end of the day, the bicycles get redistributed around the stations, and at the start of the next day, they have to be reload balanced so that busy stations that are by major metro centers need more bikes. But uh, you know, if somebody rode their bike off in the boonies and then took a taxi back and left the bike somewhere else, um, it's not where it needs to be at the start of the new day. So a manager of city bike wants to rebalance bikes at night, run around with a truck and move bikes from here to there. How many bikes should he move from where to where? And that's the question I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at answering. Okay, uh, that's a, and the demo. Okay, so uh, I'm going to fire up um, IPython notebook here and see that. Okay, bam, IPython notebook. I'm going to fire up a cluster of one. So here's Java. I'm going to do XMX 8 gig. You can't hardly see it, but there's one jar file. Uh, and that gives me a cluster of one. And in about that much time, if I'd had a second one, I'd get a cluster of two or three, but I'm just doing this on my laptop um, to make life easier for demos. So go through demo. Grab the city bike large demo. Oh, great, I'm updating things. Okay, so here's Python notebook. Um, let me clear all prior things and, and go. So import the H2O. H2O init, this step says, go find a cluster, and if I get an IP and a port, it would go find H2O cluster wherever I have it. I give it a default, so it went to the default port that H2O comes up on the default, and basically it says I have access to an eight gigabyte uh, H2O cluster um, with four cores. Let's see 
here. So there's a setup to go find my data. And here's a bunch of CSV files. And I'm just going to start it here. In a second, I'm going to let the demo take off and run. But this is pulling data from disk into the Java heap. And if I switch over to the Java window, I can see I've got a parallel parse of 10 files going. Uh, and I'm pulling in a couple gigabytes of data here. And we'll give my, give my, give my uh, there, it's done. Uh, and there's some summary gets printed out. Okay, so back in IPython notebook, I just loaded in 10 million rows and 15 columns of data. It was a couple gigabytes on disk. And there's a list of the files it went through. So at this point, I'm gonna let this Python notebook take off, and then I'm gonna start talking stuff here. Run all below. Make sure I get that right here. Okay, so uh, now I'm looking at Python code that's uh, doing data munging. And so the first thing is I've pulled out a thing I've called data. That is the name of the data frame I have in Python. So what's a data frame? It's the same as an R data frame. It is a two-dimensional table with named columns going across and 10 million rows going down. And it, it, it's distributed throughout a cluster. In this case, it is a cluster of one, but if I had a cluster of 10 machines, it would have roughly a million rows in each machine. Or maybe I would have uh, a billion rows or 100 billion rows. Um, and that would be distributed around my cluster. And then the, the columns going across are essentially a Python dictionary. I, I can name them. I can also have an order so you can give them by index. And you can mess with them. So I, I pulled out start time, come up with a constant for seconds per day, and I do a division of the start time for the bike trip by seconds per day. I'm coming up with what day did that bike trip start on. So I'm just coming up with the day the bike trip started. So I have a math on uh, 10 million rows, and that ran through here. And I have an output which wraps because the font is small. And the last column here, days, has showed up. Uh, and you can't see it, but somewhere in here is like 15887 is the day since the epoch. And there's a 16314 is the max day. And those between those two is the range of a year and a half of days since the Unix epoch. OK, so basically, I'm trying to show some little bits of data munging. So here's group by. So I'm going to group by the day since the epoch and the start station name. Well, how many stations? What's this? I have 340 stations here. So I'm going to come up with 340 stations by about 400 days, about 140,000 rows after the group by. What I'm really doing is I'm counting bicycle trips that are starting at every station on every day. So I'm going to end up with the number of bikes that left a station on a given day. And uh, that's the H2O group by here being called out from Python. And then a little show and description. Here is a summary of that. This is about 140,000 rows. The days are going from you know, 15,000 to 16,000. Um, the bike trips are from one here to a max of 691, an average of 74, standard deviation of 64. It says that I've got, about, uh, I've got a lot of variation. Some day, some station, one bike. Some day, some station, almost 700 bikes. And in between, there's a very wide variation. So I'm trying to make a prediction how many bikes are leaving a station on any given day, but I have a lot of variation. So I'm going to make a prediction to try and, and you know, figure out what the right number should be, but starting with a very large variance. So one of the other things I'm going to throw in here real quick is, oh, here's a sample, the first 10 rows. It, the bikes per day dot show was here's 10 rows. I could ask for all 10 million, but, but we'll just, you know, here's a station, and here's the number of bikes that left that station on that day. The other thing here is um, I printed out the compression. The, the output at this point says that I have about a megabyte after compression to hold the data. So it is really shrunk it down a lot here. Yeah? So th this is, I've taken a data set that's a static thing, and I'm going to make a build a model on it and then use it to make predictions. So given that model, the, the, you know, the manager at City Bike could plug in the day and the weather coming up in here. I'll mess with weather as well and come up with a set of predictions on how many bikes he should have. So that, that's how that's supposed, that's the, that's the demo model I'm working toward. How it would actually work for this guy, I don't know. But I'm going to come up with a set of predictors that should be readily available that he could use to turn around and, and make his predictions from. Okay, I'm throwing out quantiles real quick. So the 1% quantile was 2, and the 99% quantile was almost 300 and whatever. It just shows I could do stuff fast. Um, but I've, I've talked too long, so my demo's rolled forward here. Here is um, 
I took the same, I'm going to feature engineer months into this thing with the thought that um, some number of people are going to take a bicycle ride in July because it's pleasant weather. And if you're riding in January, uh, you're riding in snow and sleet and crap. And so probably you're only riding a bike because it's your daily job that you must ride that bike for whatever reason. It's how you get around. So January and July are probably interesting indicators of who's riding and why. Same thing for day of the week. If I'm riding on a weekend, it's probably a joy ride. If I'm riding on a Monday morning, it's probably because I'm going to work. So I threw in some predictors, which I just did by doing the basic math on the, the start day um, to convert that into a, a month and a day of week. So standard sort of time munging things. And I added a couple new columns by just basically assigning bikes per day, assigned a new column month, which I'd never seen before, which I just took by seconds, converted it to month, but done in parallel at scale across the cluster. Um, I come up with a new data set, has some more stuff. Then I have this big ass function here, which I'm going to talk about briefly and then jump to the bottom and show the good stuff. So, this is a classic test train split holdout <coughs> operation. Um, I pick a random uniform from the R, uh, from the R uh, uh, idiom, a random uniform number from 0 to 1. Uh, and then for every row in the data set, I select if you're in. Uh, uh, in the train test or holdout based on whether the random number was 0.6, between 0.6 and 0.9 or above. So what really I'm showing here is this expression auto expanded under the hood to do a parallel distributed array math of a random number that was already sorted throughout the cluster and 0.6, the constant, come with a column of Booleans, and then the Booleans use a selector to pick a, to pick a, a, a train element. Same here. This was a random column of booleans, a random column of booleans. There's an add that went across the cluster in parallel, and then a selection made for test and holdout and so on. So I'm doing data munging where I'm auto expanding uh, 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 operations I'm doing across uh, a big array, in, including you know, in parallel around my cluster. And then I'm running my high end algorithm. So here's a gradient boosted method, random forest and GLM. I've handed in uh, test and train. I'm handing in my response column, which is the bikes. Um, for GBM, I've said you know 500 trees and a max depth and a learn rate, and uh, you know for GLM, there's some family. It's Poisson's accounting problem. So I'm using a Poisson distribution instead of a, a Gaussian or a logistic or something. Um, uh, you know lambda set to whatever, and away it goes. So then I'm going to print things, and these models have already been built while I've been yakking um, because I'm talking too slow now. Um, but what I can see out of here is <coughs> uh, it's a regression model, so it's a count of bike trips. So I have an R squared I'm printing out, and it's seeing that the gradient boosted method has come up and says I got a 96% on my train. But if you go to the test set, you see it's like 92%. So there's a little bit of overfitting going on. But I'm like 92% of my variance has been explained here by this model just straight up, so without any further work. Um, random forest is not quite as good. Um, I could make the random forest run longer and get a little better answer, but it's going to top out at a little lower value typically. And then the generalized linear modeling. Um, it's doing, doing reasonably well at 77%. Um, if I don't do Poisson, if I do a Gaussian distribution, it sucks pretty bad. But at Poisson, it, it, it does a better job. OK. So let me go see if I can make this, make, make this go better here. So I'm going to add some weather. So I did a uh, month, and I thought, well, maybe I can grab some weather data and say, was it raining that day? So if the prediction is, it's going to rain today, is that going to impact your riding a bike? Right? Do you want to get your, you know, how wet do you want to get? Right. So I went ahead and grabbed hourly weather data from New York City for the two years in question. And I printed it out here. And of course, after the, ah, I see, aha, I see what's going on. OK, hang on. The problem is, is that my mouse slides down the podium and drags to the bottom where the windows all pop up. It's all very exciting. OK, um, so there's, way, uh, there's a ton of columns. Um, if I scroll on down, you can't see because of the wrapping, but most of them are missing. There's a huge count of missing elements in here. Uh, I'm going to way down here. OK, I know you can't tell what's going on, but all the numbers that say 17,000 and such rolling by, those are all counts of missing rows out of my 17,000 or so hours per day on two years. So a lot of missing. And then there's the compression on the weather data. OK, so a lot of the data is kind of junky. So I'm going to throw most of it out. I'm going to just sub-select weather two from weather one by only picking some things that look sensible, including all the time fields, because I need to use them for a, a join. 
Let them grab like the dew point, humidity, the precipitation, the temperature, and the weather code number one had some stuff in it, including like it snowed. Like, are you riding in the snow or not? Um, and they rename some of these long columns are shorter, and I can almost fit it on one screen. It wraps a little bit here. Um, but you can see the dew point on the right uh, from uh, minus 26 to 24, the humidity level from 0.12 to 1, the mean humidity is 60%. Now, I live in, you know, San Jose. 60% sounds like, <laughs> like a hot house. Yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, it would certainly impact my, my desire to ride. Um, and then if I look at the missing count on the, the last row of the data here, missing count along here, due to the wrapping, it's hard to see the column number, but that's the, that's the weather code. Um, uh, missing most of the days involved. And then the next one over is actually the rain. So, so there's missing value for rain, and it's here. It's, most of these are missing. So what I did with from next here is I'm going to clean up some of that stuff. Um, I'm going to cut the data set down to just grab the, the, the weather at noon. Because figure I don't actually care about the weather at midnight or even after you're done riding a bike for the day. And I didn't want to do an approximation for the whole day. So I just grabbed noon weather by simply filtering out that the local hour was noon. Uh, and then I went ahead and took the year, month, and day columns and munched them together and came up with milliseconds since the epoch by doing a standard time munching thing and then converted those to days since the epoch, the same way I did before. And uh, I get an additional days column here and some milliseconds. And then go ahead and drop all the old time columns. Oh, the rain where I said was missing. Mostly when it's missing, it actually is zero. So for the algorithms in question, if the data is missing, they're going to do one kind of thing. That it says that they really don't know. Where if we think that's actually zero, that, that says something very definitive. It didn't rain that day. It's probably good weather. So, um, so I went ahead and replaced the missing values, which in Python would be none, with rain. So again, this is a, you know, a, a, a big data math expression where rain equal equal none is simply an equality check on missing value, and then that could meet with a Boolean vector of all the rows that were missing, and then I assign a zero where it was missing. Fine. Um, then I do a merge. This is effectively a join. Uh, and then I'm going to drop extra columns. Let me skip the display. Oh, I didn't show the dropped columns. All right, fine. So in, in this <clears throat> summary here, I'm looking at 10 rows where there's a day number, there's a start station name. I have the station as an enum that you can get printed out as well. The number of bikes that left that day, the month, the day of the week, the humidity fraction, oh, that first line, 93% humidity that day, and half an inch of rain. Um, and you know, going down, you can see different times and dates and missing values and whatever. And now I'm going to run this split fit predict again with weather data. And so out of this, I'm going to see that uh, the GBM remained at about the same level. The random forest went from like 82 to 86 percent, and GLM went up to 78 percent from 77 or 79 percent from 77 percent. And just saying, I got good enough already. So either New Yorkers are sort of immune to weather, or the month was a highly correlated to the weather in New York. And I didn't need actually to add weather. They got like 2 percent across the board. Yeah. A absolutely, absolutely. Right. Mm. Absolutely. So, so I'm doing a demo on showing us driving a clustered computing solution, and I'm not actually trying to solve the data science problem, right? So uh, you could surely do a better job here. Right? I'm, 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 I'm just. Okay. How's it? How, how does it feel? How does it work? So, so that's the, the demo. Let's see how many? We've got lots of time left. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about H2O, and then I'm going to break for Q&A here for a second. Uh, how about this? OK, so um, sort of the, the, the sort of takeaway here is that we have a platform from doing um, big, most any Java code you want on big 2D tables. So here on a Python conference, I'm talking about Java. Um, really, um, anything I can do in uh, Python, I can do in Java. And furthermore, most things I can pass over the wire through the REST API. And so you get the same behavior in Python or in Java, but the Java side will take it to the next larger scale. So in, actually, in that Python code I was writing, um, that stuff I was doing would work well uh, if it was all local. And the 
infrastructure we've got will actually do it that way. So it'll run locally, but you're limited by the amount of memory you can put on a Python instance and the size of the data that you can hold in the Python instance. When you uh, uh, load the data onto H2O instead, the infrastructure will move your calls to a REST API call instead of running it locally in Python, and then it'll do the big data. Um, internally, uh, the you know what we're end up writing here is uh, single-threaded plain old Java code on plain old Java objects, and we'll make it distributed and parallel by default. So I, I won't say I've got an auto parallelizer going, but we've gone a long ways for writing code that's parallel and distributed just in a natural coding style. Um, a 16 node EC2 cluster, we can run a billion row logistic regression in four seconds. So not a small one, not just a billion rows and 700 indicators. So a pretty big one. Um, first, parallel and distributed uh, instances of gradient boosted method, uh, deep learning, and then the other algorithms are all sort of naturally done parallel in the same way. Um, where it says R integration, you might as well say Python. Same thing here. And I ran it just like you ran it. You saw me run it there, java-jar. Uh, there's no real GC tuning. It's a common bugaboo of Java programs. Um, we handle the heap well already. So that's the end of the Python display, but I'll take questions on this for a bit here, and then we can, we can try something else here, including running this step-by-step step and watch it go. Yeah. No, I'm saying, I'm sorry. So the, the, he asked, uh, he didn't understand the comment about the RESTful API scaling or not. Um, and what I was trying to say was, the we have a Python wrapper that has a data frame. It's not as well refined as like pandas, but it's pretty far along. That data frame will work on data that's local in the Python instance or uh, work with data that's in the cluster. And if it's local, it just runs a local piece of Python code to do the math. And if it's remote, it builds an expression, builds a URL, passes it over to the cluster, does some math, and gets back a handle saying, okay, the results you're looking for are in the cluster under this handle. And then the next step you do uses that handle to go drive the next job in the cluster. So the same workflow is going in Python or in a cluster. Where in Python, it's limited by what fits on your laptop, and in the cluster, it's the size of your cluster. So it's the same workflow, but it can be, you know, 100 times bigger, 1,000 times bigger in the cluster. Yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah. Uh, the answer, of course, is yes. Let's see here. Uh, let me go to the, here. So here's this code. So, um, the, the expressions um, that are just like generic, uh, do a, an array sized bulk expanded expression, those are all evaluated lazily. So that just builds an expression tree up. When I go to anything that does input or output or runs one of my big algos, that's done eagerly. And at that point, all the lazy expressions get evaluated. So there is a point at which they get evaluated. So you do printing, displays, or shows, that has to evaluate it. Uh, running the big algos evaluates it. Other things will just accumulate. Yeah. Oh, does scikit learn? Um, we're so um, there, there's sort of a limited number of algorithms in scikit learn. Oh no, scikit learn. I'm taking the wrong guy. Um, I would, I haven't done speed tests with scikit-learn. I know that when I've looked at smaller sets, um, we're very comparable to generally faster on all the, on all the machine learning tools that are out there. Uh, and when the sets get very large, we're 10 to 100 times faster. It becomes much, much faster as things get bigger. Um, we would have to, we could go do that um, here at any point in time and, and take a look. There is generally a scaling issue for very small data sets. We're not going to be as fast as sort of uh, uh, algorithms that are just doing an algorithmic solution to solve that one thing. Um, but I find that as the data sets go up to like, as soon as you hit a megabyte or a couple megabytes, uh, we're generally as fast or as fast as anything out there. And I'd be happy to run that test uh, here today and look, take a look. You, have you guys played with Scikit? Yeah, okay, well tell me, tell, tell, tell people.
Okay, fine. So we should we should play the game and find out because that's a good one to know the answer to. Especially if I'm going to do more more Python conferences. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, okay, so, so can I talk about the kinds of models? So um, we're, we're a sh tool shop. So we build tools. So the tool is, for instance, random forest or gradient boosted method. So those tools don't, they, they're like a, like a saw. It's what you build with it is, is what you do, right? So it's not like it's a population model or not. It's just, what does the tool do? Um, <clears throat> so uh, we have uh, customers from a very broad swath of, uh, we don't, there's no one vertical that people have picked us up on. We have people in healthcare, we have telcos, we have a lot of ad tech and marketing, we have health insurance, we have a lot of finance, we have like credit card fraud. Um, some of these people are doing uh, supervised learning um, you know, the credit card fraud people, they got 40 years of credit cards, uh, you know, transactions they know are fraudulent or not. Um, some of these people are doing unsupervised learning and they're looking for, you know, heart palpitations and murmurs or cancer on a x-ray blob or whatever it's going to be. Um, so it, it kind of varies all over the map. Um, we really, we hand the tool to the end user and, and help them figure their bugs out. They generally don't share their data with us. Um, and they only sometimes share with us the kind of thing they're trying to do. So I don't necessarily know what it is they're doing with the tool per se. Uh, I've seen like Cisco does a huge amount of um, inventory control and part management stuff um, because they have a huge, they're very a large manufacturer and they have a huge count of different things and they buy from all over the world and they have a huge inventory management flow problem. Um, so these, the, you know, I've talked to a guy who, who's now building uh, a thousand uh, high quality models where before he's building 60,000 disjoint models because of the size issues he couldn't deal. So now he's building one, you know, a thousand times fewer uh, uh, models, a um, hundred times fewer models uh, that are doing something to do with the demand prediction. Now is that a population model? I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. MLib, Spark and MLib. So um, we sort of think of Spark as uh, uh, an enabler for us. So we are, um, we'll, we will totally co-locate and co-work with Spark. Um, we don't do, for instance, SQL, which Spark does do. Um, generally, we can go into a place that has a, a well-running Spark cluster and plug in to their Spark cluster directly and then give them machine learning. Um, as far as you know, the, the obvious piece that goes with that is what about MLlib? Um, we don't have as many different algorithms as MLlib does, but ours typically run a uh, uh, hundred times faster, you know, ten to a hundred times faster, um, and generally with much higher quality results. So the prediction quality is up, and also um, we have on staff people whose full-time job it is to prove the validation, the correctness of the mathematical model that's getting built. So, so one of the issues you have with, with building one of these tools, like gradient boosted methods, it's very complicated, neural nets, it's a very complicated thing. So you get a bunch of Java programmers who are hacking systems people, they're doing distributed coding everywhere, whatever. They, they have stack traces. So you, you hit them with standard QA, standard QA will find your Java stack traces, and that will, you, you diagnose and fix all those bugs. So things that cause a stack trace become less and less common and eventually it's stable. But it's doing math, and so the output of a mathematical algorithm is a number. It's your prediction. Is it the right number? Well, the, the Java hacker doesn't know. So you have to have a mathematician who can do a white box deep dive into what the algorithm's doing in order to know that it's doing the right thing. To come up with a test that says, here's this funny data set that I happen to know has a certain kind of structure internally. And if your algorithm is correct, you're going to get this answer out. But if you're doing a Bernoulli distribution versus a Gaussian distribution or a logistic distribution, you're going to get a different answer out. And I can prove that by throwing this data set end to end, right? So this requires somebody that basically got PhD in math. So we have a couple of PhDs in math whose job it is is to do this kind of stuff full time on staff. So these algorithms are also extremely well tested. So it, it's, 
um, I'd like to say with it's higher quality, it's uh, much faster. And then um, there are also uh, all the bells and whistles for the algorithms we do. They're complete end to end. They have all the things you might want to have out of these algorithms. So I'm not showing other stuff coming out of the gradient boosted method. But you know, if I do a, a, a logistic model, I'll get an AEC curve out. I'll have the max F1 values. I'll have the you know min for class error and all the different kinds of things you can use to judge the quality of a model. I can immediately turn on compare that to another model I've built. You know, logistic regression with GLM or random forest or deep learning, and look at the quality of the models and that kind of you know the next step. I got a model. Oh, but I got another model. Another, another, another. How do they stack up? You know, I can do that kind of stuff all in the H2O here. The core hacking is more efficient. So, so unlike some of the other startups, we're a bunch of hardcore systems engineers who know our way around computer and performance, and we've been learning the math. So we've had to hire mathematicians and talk to you know Rob Triptrani and Trevor Hasty uh, in order to understand the math. Um, and you know they keep us honest in that sense, but we can make the machines hum. So we have better code. And you can go look at the GitHub repo and see it. And I can step you through if you're interested in what's going on. But for instance, uh, under certain circumstances, I can outrun Bloss in Java doing dumbass math, with like what Bloss is supposed to be the best on the planet for. And, and I can do it single-threaded, single-core, but then I can do it parallel and distributed as well. And it's because I'm doing stupid shortcuts that you just can't do in Fortran because I can hack at a low level in Java. So, um, so separate out mini batching from storm. So we, we, we make a model, we can, we can pretty print it as Java. So now you have a Java, a plain old Java object that'll do predictions. That'll plug into a storm bolt. And we, we have a demo, you go to our website, um, you can download and, and click through the demo, we plug it into a storm bolt. I'm sorry? It's a Java model, but it's closure. If you're doing closure, it's, it's all going. Plug right in. Yeah, okay. So, um, right, okay. So, so how much, what's the time here? Another five? Okay. Um, we'll, we'll play for five minutes here and see how far we get with it. Uh, I'll skip everything I can and get down to, okay, so here is some, some data layout. So the, the, core uh, the, the core notion is we're coding to a distributed array. So an array has uh, an, a, an accessor function at and a set. Um, there's a missing value notion, and then the length is longer than two billion. It's more than a Java int, so it's a big array. And it's gonna be very large, it's compressed very heavily, um, but I guarantee you, you know, memory access, memory bandwidth speeds if you access it sequentially striding. It's distributed across my JVMs this way. So uh, some chunk of the array is on each JVM. And actually I have a collection of them because I have some sort of data frame that has some real world connotation. The columns have labels and, and mean something to somebody. Um, however, I guarantee you the alignment such that any one observation is on one JVM. So if I have a math algo that wants to talk about a particular observation all at once, this is very common, he doesn't have to cross JVM boundaries. He's, he's going from one array to another. Think of it as a, a, a struct of arrays instead of an array of structs. Within any given vertical stripe of a column, I break things up into chunks. So somebody asked for mini batches. A chunk is typically 1,000 to a million elements. And that is my unit of compression, and it's my unit of parallel execution. The chunks are all aligned so that one core, one thread, will talk about a row and a set of rows in those set of chunks by itself. So it's a single, single threaded, no synchronization, no locking kind of thing. From his point of view, he's writing single threaded code, talking about a thousand or a million uh, observations. Uh, and of course, he just sweeps through them and that's my unit of uh, parallel execution. So I said one, but it's actually all the cores in your machine will grab a different chunk and sweep through them all. And so this is the, the classic uh, uh, data parallel uh, map call where the map is 
going from type A to type B. And then at the end of this, the, each chunk will have to be reduced with its neighbor. And that will get, take two Bs and make one B of the type system, right? Um, let, me, let me go back and step you through that real quick here. We'll do a little, little demo. I can do this in five minutes. OK. So um, you know, the coding paradigm that I write to is I say, make me a new Java object, an MR task. We call it a Mr. Task. And then hand it some data, say do all. And I get one Java instance on one JVM somewhere. These are all peer-to-peer, -peer, so I can pick any one I want to go at. Like pick one, say you, make a Java instance. OK, great. He says, oh, I, I'm supposed to touch all this data, but it's everywhere. So let me go hand a copy to each of my two neighbors. And they hand a copy to their two neighbors. And so it's logarithmic in the depth of the cluster. I pass this Java object along. And it has all my initial state of whatever I'm going to try to accomplish in this pass of the data. So it might have um, things from the last state accumulated already. It might have constants or flags or whatever. And it carries the code. The code went with it. OK, then on any one node, it's a classic divide and conquer. This is Doug Lee's fork join, right? So one task says, oh, I have to touch all this data on this one node. It's too much. I'll make another clone and say, each of us do half. And again, half and half and half and so on until I have one task for every chunk of data. And then I run the map call. And at that point, the code that's in that task executes on that data, single threaded, one core, one, one node, whatever, uh, all by itself. And I get the mapping from type A to type B. So the output is a task object has whatever the result of that map function is. It's in now hundreds of these tasks, thousands of them scattered around the cluster. So I have to start doing reductions to bring them back together. And then every time I have any two of them, immediately I'll do a reduction. So it's eagerly reducing uh, uh, two Bs into one B. And again, step by step and a logarithmic in reverse roll up until I have one top level instance per node. And then I run the log tree in reverse going back up the cluster where everybody who has a result, sends it back up the cluster to the neighbor, and the reductions are done uh, on each of the nodes and turns that rolls up the, the log tree until you get the last reduction into the top of the instance, and that was a pass of the data. That pass will take uh, you know, a couple seconds for a terabyte on this eight node cluster, uh, milliseconds for a gigabyte kind of thing. So it's, it's, it's memory bandwidth speeds. Typically, it's extremely fast. So I'll, I'll have to run pass over pass for a lot of these algorithms, but I, they're cheap. So this is not a Hadoop pass. This is an in-memory milliseconds per gigabyte kind of pass. So, so I think this guy was first, and then I'll get to you. Yeah. Do we talk about I.O. cost or overhead for maintaining structure? OK. So, so the overhead of splitting and maintaining stuff is actually typically infinitesimally small compared to the size of the data. It's just little tiny bits of control saying this many rows are here and that many rows are there kind of thing. The I.O. overhead depends on what the job is in this task, how big the task is relative to the size of the data. For some of our algorithms, they're very strongly scaling. They need a very small amount of I.O. for every pass of the data. And then uh, you, know, you can have more and more and more lesser and lesser machines, and it'll just keep you know, going faster and faster because um, the, the I.O. cost is so small. And some of the algorithms, I.O. cost can be very large, and that is the dominant cost. You'd rather have a few fatter machines, and it varies by algorithm. So in the case of random forest, the histograms for a deep random forest get very large, and you get bandwidth limited on the network, and, and, and you're shoveling over gigabytes of histogram data, and that is the dominant cost. For a gradient-boosted method, the trees are very small, but you need lots and lots and lots of them. And so it's actually latency bound on the network, not uh, bandwidth bound. With generalized linear modeling um, is very little traffic over the network at all. It's very strongly scaling. Uh, it almost doesn't matter uh, uh, how many machines you have and how big the network or how slow the network is. It, it just add more cores, it runs faster. So like I said, it varies by algos. OK, fine. OK, so um, I'll be around. Uh, afterwards, uh, at the booth here, um, H short AI, there's some other people. You can go see Amy and Spencer and Ray's floating around here somewhere. Uh, I think Matt's around here somewhere, too. Um, so we have a whole crew here. We can answer questions. And I guess it's time for lunch. Oh, one more talk? Oh. Thank you.